want to give the talk today on, on dukkha, uh, what we often translate as suffering. And there's a famous story of uh, a monk who was going to give a talk in Bangkok at a temple, and uh, he was late. So another monk was invited to give the talk, and he started the talk and said, and the entire talk was how uh, Buddhism is all about suffering, all about dukkha. And he gave the talk for about 20 minutes, and then the other senior uh, Ajahn teacher showed up, and uh, the first monk vacated his seat, and the second monk began to speak on how Buddhism is all about happiness. And it's true, it's both. Uh, similarly, um, there's a uh, story of um, someone once said, you know, what is it with you Buddhists? You're always talking about, uh, about suffering. And uh, the, I think it might have been Longpur Punadamo responded and said, that's not fair. We also talk about sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. <laughs> So what is this term, dukkha? To understand or approach it, uh, one has to understand the paradigm that the Buddha uh, gave that undergirds his entire teaching, namely the Four Noble Truths. And it's difficult because we come from uh, religions that are Many of the Abrahamic religions are um, founded on certain uh, ideas of, of truth. And so we're, we tend to frame the Four Noble Truths as uh, ontological categories or statements about reality. But Buddhism and the Buddhist teaching might in many ways be better um, spoken of as a training of the mind and heart. And the Four Noble Truths are intimately related to the tasks that are given for each. So many of you will know this, but the First Noble Truth, often translated as there is suffering, there is dukkha, uh, is more perhaps appropriately or easily understood in terms of the task given for the First Noble Truth which is that one is to comprehend suffering, comprehend dukkha, to know it. Um, the second noble truth is, or the task associated with it, is um, to let go of craving, which is the cause of dukkha. Thirst, tanha, to let go of thirst. The third is to realize the cessation of dukkha, uh, which is nibbana, peace. And the fourth is to develop the path to that cessation of dukkha, namely the Noble Eightfold Path, which many of you will know, uh, right, uh, in right view, right intention, right speech, uh, et cetera, all the way through right concentration. And that what this allows is an understanding that the Buddha wasn't necessarily trying to make a statement about reality unrelated to our experience, but rather pointing us to how practically we can let go of dukkha and of suffering. And it's somewhat counterintuitive because the first truth, the first task is to comprehend, to know suffering, to know dukkha. And uh, one of the best analogies, um, well, there's a few good ones, but one I really appreciate is uh, there's a story of Chagyam Trungpa, who was traveling with an entourage of uh, famous lamas in Tibet. And in Tibetan monasteries, they'll often have these enormous mastiffs, guard dogs chained. And as they entered one monastery, the mastiff broke its chain and charged at the group and everyone else ran away, but Chogyam Trungpa, um, 
ran straight at the Mastiff, and the Mastiff got scared and ran away from him. So there's something with this idea that this thing that we're constantly avoiding, dukkha, this is what we most need to turn towards and understand. Um, Shogim Trungpa's problematic in many ways, but it's a good story. Um, another really, uh, I think, helpful analogy is uh, Frank Ostaseski gives it. Um, he was teaching about the Four Noble Truths in Idaho, and he got to the First Noble Truth, and someone from the audience chimed in and said, oh, it's like telephone poles. And uh, he said, what do you mean? And the man said, it, I used to work installing telephone poles. And the foreman said, if this pole begins to fall, which way do you run? And initially I said, well, you, you run away. And he said, no, the foreman said, what you need to do is run right up to this telephone pole and place your hands on it. Because that's exactly how you know which way it'll fall. That's the safest place to be. So we have a large telephone pole in our lives, and it is dukkha. So what does it mean to stop a constant running from it and to turn towards it? This is the quintessential moment or movement of the spiritual path. And instead of running, to try to understand and to let go of its cause. So this brings us to translating dukkha. And uh, first of all, it's helpful to know that there's two levels of dukkha. And this is a common misunderstanding. Um, the Buddha compares it to two arrows. There's the dukkha of the three characteristics of experience. Experience, the world, is impermanent. It's not self, it's not under our control, um, and it is inherently unsatisfying. So things do fall apart. Um, there is poignancy in life. We have loss, we are broken. We are not what we want to be. We are disappointing in various ways. It's part of what we are. It's part of what samsara is. Then there's the second arrow, and this is the optional one that we continue to shoot ourselves with. This is the arrow, the dukkha of the Four Noble Truths, caused by craving. This is the suffering of craving it for it to be otherwise. Uh, and not to say that acceptance of the world doesn't mean we can't affect change on the world or work towards meaningful movement, but this constant belief it shouldn't be this way or I want it to be otherwise right now. Craving, thirst for more, for something else, trying to fill a hole which can never be filled up. Um, this is the second arrow, and this is the one that the Buddha is teaching us to let go of, or rather just to stop shooting ourselves with. That would be enough. So in this context, uh, dukkha, which is often translated as suffering, um, it's, um, suffering can work in some cases. And yet, it's also too strong of a word. Um, you know, there's, uh, Ajahn Jeff remembers asking an audience, you know, in Thailand, uh, telling about the Four Noble Truths, and someone came up and said, I, I don't suffer. And Ajahn Jeff said, are you, are you ever stressed? And he said, oh yeah, I'm stressed all the time. Stress is another term. Dukkha comes, uh, there's two etymologies. One is, du means bad, uh, wrong. Ka means uh, a hole, and what it can mean is the axle hole in a chariot. The um, people that took over uh, India at that time from the Hasapan, uh, Harapan culture uh, were charioteers, and this idea of an axle that's always off, always a little bit off, that's dukkha. Things are never quite aligned. Another etymology is uh, du, bad, and then stra, which means to stand, and it's this idea that things are never steady, they're always wavering, always not quite firm. And dukkha can mean everything from the traditional uh, chant we do is um, birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha, death is dukkha. Um, and this is quite funny because uh, Longpur Sumedho, when he first came to Thailand, he asked a monk, what's or the monk asked him, what are angels like in, in, the, you know, in, in, in America? And he said, well, in Christianity, you know, they have these wings, they have this harp. And the Thai monk was like, okay. And Longpur Sumedha said, what are angels like in, in Buddhism? And the, the monk said, well, it's, it's birth, aging, and death. 
those are the those are called the devaduta, the heavenly messengers in Buddhism. Um, and that's hard to understand initially, um, and we can get into it more in a, in a second, but all to say that these fragilities in reality, the reality we see, keep us from taking refuge in it and keep us looking for something more, which is essential. If things are too comfortable, we don't look. We don't embark on a path. And so these are our angels as Buddhism, as Buddhists, of birth, aging, and death. We also have other angels, but these are, these are the three Devadutta. Uh, the fourth is a renunciant. The chant goes on to say, uh, separation from the liked is dukkha. Association with the disliked is dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. And most of the time, you know, this is, this is our life. We come into contact with things we don't like. We lose those things we do. And then the Buddha finishes this phrase by saying, in brief, the five aggregates of identity are dukkha, which is what usually initiates the, wait, what? <laughs> the other ones make a lot of sense initially, but this idea that whatever we attach to in this frail and fra uh, fragile realm will break. And rather than that being a dismissal of it, the quintessential movement in Buddhism is either one of feeding off of this world, feeding. The Buddha, there's a sort of catechism that was given to many novices and young monks uh, in, in the Buddhist teachings. It's in the Diganakaya. And uh, he says, what is the one? And the one is the fact that all beings feed. All beings feed. So what we're doing in Buddhism is trying to change from this orientation of feeding to one of blessing. And just this seeing that the world is falling apart, and as much as we feed on it, as we depend on it, as we tie our hearts to it, then when it breaks, the heart breaks. And also you can't love something that you're feeding off of. So just seeing clearly that this is the nature of the conditioned realm. It is dukkha, it is unstable, it is a wheel that is always off. And this squares quite well, actually, with a pretty wholesome view of what original sin might have meant. Uh, the uh, word for original, for sin in Greek is hamartia, which is an archery term. It means missing the mark. So can we think of it that way, how the world just misses the mark? Uh, and we, we are always missing the mark somehow. And just through the acknowledgement of that aspect of things, this broad term or definition of dukkha is, is useful because it does encompass everything from the most brutal losses in our lives to even the subtle perturbations and stress points in a delicate or refined meditative state. Um, and this is uh, really useful because if you, know, you do achieve or come to a state of unification of mind and heart, often there's not suffering there. In, in what we take that term to mean. But there is stress. There is a small stress. There's something you're still doing. And can you let go of that and just keep letting go? So dukkha can mean all these things. And it was very intentional that although the Buddha gives, gives these definitions, he also gives an intentionally circular definition of what dukkha is. There's one uh, sutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya 59, where uh, someone, these two, this monk and this householder are arguing and saying the Buddha teaches this many kinds of feeling, um, of kinds of happiness, uh, say. And the Buddha says, actually, both of you are right. I have taught uh, two kinds of feeling, three kinds of feeling, six kinds of feeling, 36 kinds of feeling, and so on. And in the end, he says, look, he basically goes through this progression where he says, you know, then the first jhana, which is a state of concentration, of unification of mind, that is sukha and then the second, and then the third, and eventually Nibbana, awakening, is Sukha. In wherever Sukha is found, that the Tathagata, the Buddha, declares as Sukha. And in a, a philosophical debate context, uh, that would, a circular argument would completely be, um, you know, a fallacy. You couldn't bring it to bear. 
But the Buddha's wisdom in using it here is very relevant because what he's pointing to is this term of dukkha and sukha change over, the ter over our practice. So initially, we might see, um, you know, going to a movie with some friends or going out for a night of drinking as sukha, it's happiness. But after we practice for a time, it begins to feel coarse, forced. Uh, it becomes dukkha. And similarly, sitting alone in a room, quietly meditating, is for most many people the perfect image of hell. And over time, it becomes, you realize the peace that's hidden there. And so it becomes sukha. So in this brilliant turn of a teaching, the Buddha gives us room to redefine sukha and dukkha depending on where we are in our practice. It's like the rungs of a ladder. You reach up towards a new, more refined level of sukha, and after you've pulled yourself up and rested for a time, then you realize suddenly even that is now a form of dukkha. It's stressful. It can be let go of. And so you're ready to reach for a new rung of the ladder. Before going on to some of the other ways the Buddha speaks about dukkha, it's important to see that this is the quintessential movement of the spiritual path, is turning towards dukkha. It is why it is the first noble truth. It is right there at the very beginning. Because as long as our lives are spent running from that instability, from that sense of dissatisfaction, it's a never-ending game. No matter how good things get, uh, always things equalize again. And uh, you find yourself once again in the midst of uh, dissatisfaction, of things not being quite right. And to see that what dukkha helps us do is, you know, the Buddha says that a cause of faith and of the path is, is suffering. Although suffering can lead to bewilderment and confusion, it can also lead to faith, to joy, to the path. And this is how many of us have come and remain on the path of spiritual practice, is we, we understood the limits of this American dream, American nightmare, whatever you want to call it, that's held us, us out to us. Um, we are meant for more than a well-adjusted middle-class life. And not that that can't be part of our path, but it is not the end goal. It is a means to an end, and that is it. And the heart intuits this, but sometimes it takes a strong shake, a strong tragedy, a strong vision of dukkha, or just the buildup of that vision over many, many years. This is the midlife crisis moment for us to finally realize that we're in a game that we cannot win or is not worth winning. And then either you buy a Harley Davidson or you come to a meditation group. <laughs> so I applaud all of you, although I think she has a, ve a Vespa, <laughs> so that's all right. But just to realize that in some sense the whole world is, I've used this phrase before, but it's falling apart in its eagerness for us to realize what lies underneath. Someone once said of depression, you can either look at it as a fist trying to crush you, or you could look at it as a hand gently trying to push you down onto solid ground until you find solid ground. And in a similar way, you can think of karma as these negative states and situations and difficult things in our lives as retribution for some past act. Or you can think of it as a gentle hand teaching you the exact lesson you need to learn. We don't Things that don't stick as splinters in the heart are things that we've already let go of. So wherever the world's pushing you, that is exactly where you need to be working with. That's exactly where you need to let go of craving. Where you suffer, the difficult boss, the spouse that's not uh, behaving like you wish they would. Um, these are this is exactly what the Dhamma will ask you to learn to let go of. Not let go in the sense of distance yourself or throw it away, but to recognize your craving, your grip, and your feeding on it, and realize that you can let go a little bit. 
And we, this is why we cultivate meditation and spiritual community and morality is so that we have an inner wealth that allows us to step away from feeding and move towards blessing the world. But to acknowledge that this, um, another analogy the Buddha gives of dukkha is of fire. And this is one of the brilliant uh, points of the Buddha's teaching is before the Buddha, uh, fire was looked on as an extremely, uh, something to be cultivated. It was called tapas, or spiritual heat. And one of the Buddha's most profound teaching moments, or, or one of his really powerful teaching moments, was in the Aditya Pariyaya Sutta, where he took all these flame uh, fire-worshipping ascetics, like people who developed very strong meditation using fire as their object, and he took them to the top of a hill where that was overlooking a, bur uh, uh, a forest fire. And this is showcasing the Buddha's skill in using his environment to teach. And he said, look, all things are burning. The eye is burning, the ear is burning, the tongue is burning with the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. And the goal is not more fire, not more heat, but coolness, nibbana. Nibbana means cool. So to recognize that dukkha burns, it hurts. And that without being with that burn, I call practice the slow boil, because you don't get out of it. What you get, though, is this ability to sit through it. The Buddha said, patient endurance is the supreme incinerator of defilement. And uh, you know, one way of referring to meditation is sitting in the fire. And just acknowledging that when you're able to encounter these old suffering, these old sankars, these old attachments and craving, and not act on them, and just sit with that fire until it burns through you, you are letting go. The heart is intuiting a little more the red-hot nature of these khandas, of these aggregates we cling to, the body, the personality, feeling. It's something you can know intellectually, but until your heart has continually burnt itself and felt that and released its grip, you won't let go. There's no shortcut past that. So just acknowledging that part of this practice is sitting through that and understanding that that spaciousness that comes on the other, hand, other side of that burning, when you've managed to hold still, when you've managed not to lash out in anger, when you've managed not to act on doubt, when you've come to that place of peace, of the third noble truth, that's, there's a majesty and a spaciousness there. That's the hand that was gripping open and filling with sunlight. And the path in Buddhism can be thought of as a transition from the energy of fire, bound, agitated, to one of sunlight. And similarly, if you're really pouring yourself into practice, really acknowledging just these places that are most difficult, that are most rife with suffering, that's exactly, that is your biggest spot of practice. It's not some, you know, difficulty or inconvenience. The spouse, the job, the doubt, the depression, this is exactly what's been given to you to work with, to become, to develop these qualities of patience, of care, to develop this letting go. Where you trip is where you dig for treasure. And to understand that why would the Dhamma ask for you to let go of something you weren't attached to. So we all have this experience as you find something good and suddenly all your old sankara, all your old programming comes to bear on it. And the meditation group you thought was so nice, suddenly your FOMO's in full raging force and or you find you're anxious about it and, and all these old patterns come to this thing which was sacred. And just acknowledge like that's exactly what's supposed to happen. This is your forum and the Dhamma will push you right to your brink, but never past it. So just expect that, is you will come to something good. You will get to rest in the third and the fourth noble truth, peace and the path. But then, as practitioners, you can expect you will swing right back and you'll have a few first noble truth weeks, or maybe a first noble truth year. You'll have your dukkha year. And uh, just to expect this, like usually when I have a good meditation, I'll, I'll just think, oh no, tomorrow, it's gonna be bad. Because dukkha is how we orient ourselves. Another word of dukkha is a perturbation, a knot, a palpitation, injita, pa, uh, pandita, papanchata. And that's the Pali. And it's a locus, it's a focal point. 
And when you step into this spaciousness, you'll notice after the death meditation, there is this brightness, but it's disorienting. And when the mind and heart become disoriented, they will flail hard for the thing they recognize. And what they recognize and what they know is suffering. The last thing you can get people to let go of is their suffering. So to acknowledge that the Dhamma will push you right where it's most difficult and that that's not a bad sign. One use of fire is to forge an instrument and the Dhamma and the world and your practice will apply heat to you in exact measure to the instrument it wants to forge you into of kindness, of caring. Because the more you let go, the more you have a hand to give the less you're clinging on to and feeding off of the people you love, the more you can really be there just to give to them and let them be who they are. Guide them as you're able, but stop feeding off of them. And the fire, the sense of dukkha, if approached with right view, if traced back to the craving which causes it, um, it can be something that forges us rather than just melts us. And that energy of fire can transition to one of light. So I wish you all the best. Okay, people can feel free to stand up and kind of shake out a little bit if you want. Um, should we do 10 minutes of breakout groups and then questions or just do questions? All for breakout groups, raise your hand. All for questions, raise your hand. Okay. It's not, not totally disproportionate, but we'll go for questions. So, um, yeah, feel free to, uh, yeah, really do feel free to stand up and move around if you're getting a bit antsy, but um, raise your hand and let us bring a mic over to you and then just uh, say your name before your question. If you're joining us on Zoom or YouTube, feel free to raise your electronic hand or type your question into the chat. And it can be anything you'd like to talk about or bring up. Trenton. So, um, can you, can you guys hear me? Can everyone hear me? Testing, testing. So um, during the during the, met, the death meditation, I think I kind of had the opposite experience. Um, I think that so I kind of have a habit of uh, living for others and kind of suppressing any kind of taking up of space at all in like an emotional or interpersonal space and uh it's funny because i used to tell myself like well the self is impermanent i'm just the five condos i'm gonna die anyways and i thought kind of suppressing anything that resembled a personality made me really good at the buddhism thing um but when when it was like letting go of like uh like your possessions and like the people in your life and things like that those kind of just feel like things that were kind of thrust upon me, like it doesn't even feel like me. Uh, and I kind of, trying to let those things go, it kind of made me grip to this idea of like, like this weird like ideal of like an authentic me that like just does, doesn't exist in the world at all. It just made me grip to that even tighter. And it just left me with this really intense feeling of like regret and like suffocation and uh, it's not really a, I guess it's not really a question, but for me it's kind of just like, well, everything's a nada, so it's like, doesn't matter. Um, but so, what are your thoughts on that? So the meditation brought up uh, that sense of suffocation or it just didn't really hit anything because you already weren't considering those things yourself? It kind of just like forced me to, I think, confront like how alienated I feel from like anything at all. Yeah, well, that's a hyperbole, but no, uh, thank you, Trenton. 
Yeah, that's an intense meditation. Um, so <laughs> I think last time we did it, we had a few people crying in a bathroom and some other things. So just to say, it's common to have, it's interesting what death meditation brings to the surface. It's why the Buddha recommended it. Um, I'd say this is one place where Buddhism um, really shines is um, there's a limit to many Western psychological systems. I won't make blanket statements about all, them all, but many of them go into your past stories um, and kind of articulating them and thereby supposedly putting them to rest. Um, or, you know, developing kind of an equanimity with thought by not identifying with it. And, and all that's very valid. But what Buddhism provides is the Noble Eightfold Path can be divided into sila, morality, uh, ethics, uh, which is like the internalization of these um, ways of acting that align with ourselves and with Dhamma. Um, uh, samadhi, so uh, ability to unify and brighten the mind. And then Panya, wisdom, which is viewing everything in terms of the Four Noble Truths at its most foundational. And what depression and alienation have is a great deal of Panya. There's a lot of wisdom in seeing, and I think it's the cause for a lot of addiction and, and depression and suicide and other things, is people really do intuit, the goals I'm being given are not worthy. And I do have this disconnect and I am kind of alone. Um, and the difficulty uh, with that is that path lacks the first two factors of the Buddhist path. Wisdom can only be developed at that level. It's really out of balance in many moderns. When sila, ethics, and samadhi, brightness of mind, have been developed, because those two things brighten the mind when you're letting go of other things. They provide this foundation that's you can't point to exactly what it is. It's just that the mind is bright and you begin to have a very intuitive sense of, of what's there when letting go of, of these other things. And I just say that, you know, Longpur Suchitta says 80% of the practice at first is just strengthening the chitta, the mind and heart. And there's immense healing power in the precepts and in coming into a spiritual community I mean, we've lived most of our lives in a culture and in an education system and often in social structures which are, are brutal and dry and, and, to ex and really I think we can think of ourselves stepping onto this path as patients in a hospital a bit. Like, it takes a while for our hearts to put themselves back together and gain that strength. Um, and strength might be the wrong word, like, I think you have a very strong heart, but just to say that Having faith that this path, as you continue to meditate, as you continue to, continue to give and cultivate the full sila and samadhi, then when there are these meditations or moments of letting go, that more and more there is this sense of uh, a light and something that holds you in the midst of that. Um, but just to have patience as that develops, I mean, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, we've been traumatizing ourselves for lifetimes, and at the very least, just this life. Um, so to give your heart a chance to grow in brightness and heal, you know, we're all kind of, and it can be very raw at first. It's a bit like stepping into spiritual practice is like scraping off a scab. It's a raw wound at first, and just to give ourselves space while it heals. So, so that's something I, does that uh, address the question at all, or the, or the think, thinking a bit? Can I talk to you about it later? Definitely. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I, I, I would say one, you know, one thing is Vipassana and the secular meditation movement in the West has been very isolated and siloed. People are very lonely. And it's one of the, you know, spiritual community is huge. The Buddha was giving many of these teachings in the context of uh, communities and societies which are profoundly integrated. And we are not. So just to like, have a lot of faith just in the like, ability to be here with so many good people and trust those connections to grow and heal. But it can take years. Um, yeah, uh, Ajahn Achalo was uh, at Longpur Nan's monastery where I ordained and just had this day of like, 
brutal suffering, and he just kind of like put his anksa, his monastic shirt over his head, and just kind of screamed into it. And then he went and found Long Por Anand and said, when will it be easier? And Long Por Anand said, after five years, it'll be a little easier. <laughs> so, but also, Ajahn Sona says after like three years, you can expect to be 50% happier. So I think both actually are true. Okay. We have uh, Mary online. Mary, go ahead. Thank you. Hello, Ajahn. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to further that talk about faith, having how faith helps us. I listened to a really nice talk by Ajahn Amaro the other day that I wanted to bring up in this context. And he was speaking, um, he, re he told about a sutta, which I don't remember the names or anything of, but the Buddha was talking with a king and the king was saying, I'm really worried that when I die, all this stuff about my mind, about going on in my life, I'm busy taking care of affairs of state, I'm worried about the borders, I'm doing this, kind of like we are in our worldly lives, worrying about this, worrying about that. And he said, I'm worried that when I die, those will be my last thoughts. And the Buddhist gave this beautiful analogy that I wanted to bring up in this context. And he talked, he said, well, imagine a pottery crock filled with ghee and you drop the crock in the water, what would happen? And the king said, well, the, the um, pot would break and the ghee would rise to the top. And the Buddha said, just so with your practice, simply by putting in this time together and practicing and everything, when, when the body falls apart, this practice will rise to the top. Being closer to death than many in the room, I found that very comforting. And um, and it goes along with what you're saying, I think, that what was left in that death contemplation for me were the Brahma Baharas and a gratefulness, you know, for having it. So um, great, I'm a great fan of faith and, and of steady practice. So I just wanted to pass that up. Thank you, Mary. Yes, that's a uh, to Mahanama. The Buddha says, um, even as a pot of ghee dropped into the bottom of a cool lake would crack, and the shards of clay lie on the ground as the ghee rises to the surface, even so, when this body is uh, dead, decayed, feasted on by jackals, the mind, if it's been long nourished with faith, uh, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom will rise to the surface. Uh, do not fear, Mahanama. You said it much better than I. <laughs> <laughs> Yours was pretty good. <laughs> hey, we have two more people online, but if there's anybody in the room, maybe. You know, yeah, let's let's alternate if we have anyone in the room. Gary has one. I want to make reference to a poem by my favorite poet, um, philosopher, because it speaks directly to that image of the ghee. My wife and I have both identified a poem that we want read at our um, memorials, and it speaks to that fact that everything that we are will be gone. And everybody who's there memorializing us will be aware that we're gone. But everything that we were that was of any value at all will be in their hearts. And so to me, that's the image that I think Mary was just speaking. Thank you, Mary. There's a beautiful story of Kafka. Um, this girl lost her doll in the uh, park and uh, she was distraught and so Kafka um, started leaving uh, uh, letters on her doorstep every few months from her doll from different places in the world where it was traveling. And finally, when she, uh, I think at the end of high school, she found a new doll on her doorstep, returned. And years later, she found that there was a little note tucked into its hand that said, your love will always, everything 
you love will disappear, but the love will always come back to you in new forms. So it's one of the beautiful ideas of Sankara is these goodness, this goodness we cultivate continues, yes. Joseph, you can unmute. Hi, Ajahn. Thank you so much for your talk. I was reading the uh, biography of Ajahn Mun, and uh, near the end of his life, he said it's, he was in a continuous state of generating loving kindness and dedicating it for all beings. And that's the state he was in when he was dying. And I was wondering how we could practice to get to that state as well. Thank you. That is the question. <laughs> it's a good one, Joseph. I think you're doing a good job of it. Um, but n no, I, I think loving kindness practice is really, really important. Uh, Long Pornon, my teacher, says that uh, modern, sh no, he said Westerners, um, should uh, do 10 minutes of med loving kindness at, I think it's either at the beginning of every meditation session or every day. Um, I think every day is really good. And so like first thing when you wake up before you even move, you can bring your awareness to your heart and just kindle something there before you move. Just take that, that time. Um, it pays dividends through the day to kind of crystallize the self around loving kindness right at the start. Um, yeah, and, and then, but to understand that these other means of practice, of wisdom, of letting go, they all lead towards loving kindness. I mean, that's the thing is you find that when you do let go in a dharmic way, what's left is a, a selfless, loving response to the world. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think, keep doing what you're doing, Joseph. Hello, my name's Bethany. Um, I'm curious to know if there's sort of a counterbalance that you might offer. For example, um, if a person's kind of at a place where the suffering situation that they're in, that even with practice, they're just not able to get their head above it. Um, and there's opportunities to remove yourself or to try to keep staying in that place. Do you have any thoughts around how to not stay with the suffering in a sense that is wise because um, there's some situations where I've struggled to keep my head above and I'm similarly there, but I've been advised to just kind of find ways to be happy in a way, which seems kind of the counterbalance. I know you say it's, it all depends, it's all contextual what um, could be offered to someone. Yeah, great, great question. Um, spiritual bypass, we can call that. Um, I think the, so the question being, um, yeah, how do we know when we're in a situation where we just turn towards, try to comprehend the suffering present and take it as part of our practice versus when do we actually take action to change things? Yeah, something like that. Um, so uh, uh, Ajahn Amaro compares practice to sharpening a knife and if the, he uses this actually in the context of samatha, or tranquility, um, and vipassana, insight. And if we have too much calm in our practice or our lives, too much retreat, then the angle can be very shallow. Um, I think this is more an issue for monks at monasteries than everyone in the lay, in the, I think you have plenty of suffering, all of you. Um, <laughs> so, um, but the, the knife just stays dull. But if the angle's too sharp and there's too much interaction with the world, then it blunts the blade too. And finding that balance is, is the key. Um, and I'd say some really good metrics are, uh, you know, first you have to be keeping a daily meditation practice to have any forum for that voice to manifest. And um, one, you know, doubt is a hindrance. And one of the fires you sit through to get to the other side is doubt. So when you're in this place of like, oh, like, do I need to move on? Do I need to change things? Am I just supposed to work with this? Letting, just be, name it, doubt, this is doubt. And then wait until it will, it will cease. And then there will be usually a moment of clarity where you're like, no, enough's enough. And um, it, it's helpful to listen to the tone of voice of your internal monologue there. Like, 
the doubting mind will have this fiery, oily aspect, whereas the voice of Dhamma, or it's personifying it, but the wholesome voice is often, even if it's saying something very clear, like get out now, it'll be, it'll be clear, grounded, you know you can trust it, and to steer your life by those, those breaths above water. And, you know, really make a lot of them. This is why we use aditana, is, uh, it means determination. So, like, if you have a moment of clarity, like, I need to get out of this apartment, I need to quit this whatever, you know, then using that talking to someone um, or making a determination, like, okay, I'm done drinking, whatever it is. Um, another use is to th ask, like, in the Mahanama, or uh, the Kalama Sutta, it's a very famous one where the Buddha says, don't rely on doctrine for your decisions. Um, when you yourself know this is wholesome, this is unwholesome, then do this thing. That's the part that's quoted, but there's another part that says, this is praised by the wise and censured by the wise. That's a really important part. So like, what would, you know, often take the wisest people you know and say, what would, what would they do right now? And, and often that advice is very clear. Like, I've had an imaginary long porpasano just be like, Nisipo, <laughs> like, this is an absurd question. Um, I think that's helpful. Uh, asking yourself the question right when you wake up uh, it has more access to your subconscious then. And a big thing I think is just like in those inter interactions, can you stay with your body? Can you maintain awareness? Can you distinguish your own reactivity from response? You know, like when are the tentacles too strong? And then you know you're not practicing and you're not helping anyone if it's just reactive back and forth. And then really stepping back is important. Finally, I, I would just say that um, some situations, like I, I went to that at this little monastery with a bunch of Thais, uh, and I was very lonely and uh, quite infantilized as the one Westerner, and it was really good to practice with for about seven months, and then it began to crystallize in me. I could feel it kind of crusting into something, something I didn't want in me. And, and I think just having an eye for that moment when something is kind of taking up residence in you as a a sankara, a program, it's come, going on auto, you know, and, and then you know, like, okay, things need to change, I, I've done enough, so. Did that help at all? Okay. I think we do have to wrap stuff up. Um, yeah. Uh, I think we have, okay, one question on Zoom. Go for it. Kira, go ahead and unmute. Kira? She online? does look frozen. Okay. Oh, you're frozen. Oh, no, she looks oh, yeah, less frozen. Okay. Go for it. Frozen. We can hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I actually, that, um, the, the previous question was actually similar to my question, so I'll ask a different one, um, which is maybe what's the, um, what are some antidotes to maybe isolation in practice? I mean, I'm obviously remote, but I think that I could characterize most of my um, experience with practices incredibly silent, incredibly isolated. And uh, I live in the Midwest currently, which is not, it's, it's just a different sort of situation. So um, maybe speaking to that, that uh, um, form of dukkha in practice, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, thank you. That's a great, great question. Um, and we're glad to have you as a Zoom box at the very least. Um, I think, uh, and I think a lot of people are in that situation. Um, one thing is if you can't get to a sitting group every week because there's not one you really resonate with nearby, batch your visits. So every three months can you get away for five days to uh, a monastery nearby or a practice center, especially a monastery. On the East Coast, there's Empty Cloud, there's Temple, West Coast, Abayagiri, um, Birkin, uh, Servasti Abbey. So, or even twice a year, can you like find a way to get to to, to batch that vacation time so you do get some touching in every now and again. Um, and then the other thing is really to, uh, I mean, do what you're doing, tap in online as you're able, but then to uh, make sure to, you know, practice the list of the ten paramitas, spiritual perfections that, that are given in the, the texts are really useful. And the first one is dana, giving. So to go to a soup kitchen, I know Joseph's done this, um, or you know, volunteer in other ways, and just understand that, like, generally, yeah, like that is connection and it is meaningful. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say capitalizing on both of those, and then, you know, if someday 
we have a monastery and you feel like moving to Seattle, you're welcome to. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So thank you, Kara. I, I think we do have to wrap stuff.